All work can be divided into conservative and non-conservative work, which has nothing to do with it being work done by a Republican or Democrat, but rather whether it's being done by a conservative force or a non-conservative force. So let's look at the first kind of work, cons non-conservative work. This is work done by a non-conservative force. Now, a non-conservative force is basically forces that is kind of takes energy away from the system. So, for example, friction, air resistance, and all applied forces are examples of non-conservative forces. Another property of non-conservative work is that the amount of work depends on the path taken. So, for example, friction. If you move something a long way versus the short way, there'll be more work done by the friction in the long way because there was more distance traveled. Finally, as we said before, work done, the non-conservative work is lost by the system. Now, conservative work, on the other hand, is not lost by the system. It's work done by conservative forces, and for this class, there are only two conservative forces, gravity and the spring force. The other thing about conservative forces is that it does not depend on the path of the displacement, but only on the initial and final positions. And last, conservative work is not lost, but conserved by the system. So, it is stored as what we call potential energy. And there's a unique formula for this. It's given by WC equals negative delta U. Conservative work is equal to negative of the change in potential energy. So what is potential energy? Well, it's another form of energy, just like kinetic energy. Whereas kinetic energy was the energy of motion, potential energy is stored energy. And we said before, there are only two types of conservative forces that we have to care about. That's gravity, gravity and spring. So there are really only two types of potential energy that we have to care about. Gravitational and energy stored in a spring. So for gravitational energy, the formula is very s simple. The, the p gravitational potential energy is given by mass times g times h, where h is the height the object is above ground level. Now this ground level can be chosen arbitrarily. We can always set where ground is. Once we set it though, the potential energy is all is measured from this level, so it's all relative to this level. Now the potential energy of a spring is slightly more complicated. It is given by u sub s equal to one half k x squared. Now this potential energy follows from what's known as Hooke's law, which describes the force that a object connected to a spring would feel. So let's take a minute to uh, see the nature of this force. So if you have a mass that's connected to a spring, and if the spring is not stretched or compressed, it's in the relaxed state, therefore the mass just stays still. This force that it feels would be zero it's not feeling any force and we let this position this relaxed position be denoted by x equals zero now all springs are defined by a constant called k which is called the called the spring constant and it describes the stiffness of the spring so if k is really small the, sp the spring is very springy, can be stretched very easily. If K is very large, then it's very stiff, can't be stretched very easily. Now what happens if we stretch this spring? Now the spring has been stretched a distance X. The uh, 
force that the mass feels will be always directed towards back to its original position, so it's a force is negative in the x direction, and it's proportional to how much you you pull it. So if you stretch it by a certain distance x, the force that that it it will feel would be minus k times x. This is known as Hooke's law. And this law is the same whether you stretch or compress a spring. When you compress a spring, a distance x to the left, the force changes sign and pushes it to the right, but the magnitude of the force is still proportional to the displacement or the distance you've compressed. So this is all you'll need to know about Hooke's law. From this law, we can integrate it to get the uh, work done by this force, and that, as we said before, would equal to negative of the potential energy. This is how we get the equation for the potential energy of a spring. But as far as you're concerned, you just need to know that for a spring, the potential energy is equal to one-half kx squared, where x is the amount of stretch or compression of the spring. Now that we've uh, introduced potential energy, we can talk about total mechanical energy, E, and how it is conserved. We're going to start with the work kinetic energy theorem. Recall that that just says that the total work done by a system is equal to the change in its kinetic energy. Now, we had said that work can be divided into two kinds, conservative work and non-conservative work, so that together they must equal to the change in kinetic energy. We also define that conservative work is a special kind of work. It's work that we can relate to an object's potential energy. So conservative work is equal to negative of the change in potential energy of an object. Now, what I can do now is take this term and bring it over to the right-hand side, and we get an expression which says that the total non-conservative work of a system is equal to the change in its kinetic energy plus the change in its total potential energy. Now note this is total, meaning if the object has gravitational, then there will be potential energy, gravitational potential energy. If it's also connected to a spring, then it also has potential energy of a spring. Now we're going to define the total energy of a system, E, which is just the sum of the kinetic plus potential energy of the system. If we make this definition, then this formula up here becomes very simply work non-conservative work equals the change in the total energy of the system. We are now ready to talk about conservation of energy. When there are no non-conservative forces, the non-conservative work of course is going to be zero. This allows us to set the previous equation to be W delta E equals zero. This means that the total energy change in t energy must be equal to zero. Another way to write this, since change in energy is final energy minus initial energy, if it equals zero, then the initial energy must equal to the final energy. Lastly, we can write this a third way by putting in directly the kinetic and potential energy, so that the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy must equal to the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy. These three forms all say the same thing. It's a statement of energy conservation, and it's only possible when there are no non-conservative forces at work. This allows us again to set W and C equal to zero. So in problems where there is no friction or no applied forces,
we can say that the initial energy must equal to the final energy.